we are talking about bundles, no? so I hope most of you already heard about what bundles are, <laughs> but we are still talking about them, what best practices are when you want to share a bundle, or you could find bundles to reuse them instead of reinventing them, and then featuring some of the most used bundles and then asking you for other stuff. Yeah, we are doing a live demo. <laughs> so I'm Christoph Kuvut, so stuff on GitHub, I think most people do already know it. So contributing to Symphony 2, Doctrine, Monologue, first user bundles, and many other bundles, which would be too long to list all of them. And it would be even longer to list the bundles I review. <laughs> and so I'm stuff 70 on Twitter. Hi, I'm Lucas Smith. Uh, was one of the original founders of the Pair Group. Uh, went on to doing uh, PHP 5.3 release management for a while. I also work on uh, different open source libraries. Um, I'm sort of the liaison between Symphony 2 and Drupal. Uh, at the same time, building a competitor with the CMF project. Uh, and here you can see my blog and uh, Twitter account. So first up, quickly, you know, what is a bundle? Uh, like Stoff said, most of you probably have worked with bundles before. Um, the key thing in Symfony 2, which sets it apart from other frameworks, is that everything is a bundle. Uh, so bundles are first-class citizens. As a matter of fact, the framework itself is a bundle, which you see with a framework bundle. And sort of the philosophy behind a bundle is to be the minimal glue code you need to put a library into Symphony 2 and or uh, you know, a set of controllers and, and commands. Um, of course, in theory, you could also have library code inside your bundle, but that's generally not the ideal way of going about it. So what can you do with a bundle? Uh, as I mentioned, you can define your controllers in a bundle. You can find your commands for the command line interface in the bundle. You can define your entities and documents. You can define additional services. And of course, you can also ship uh, various assets uh, like JavaScript files, CSS, and images. Now, whenever you want to create a new bundle or you need some feature, uh, the first thing you should do is check knpbundles.com. It's sort of the unofficial official index of bundles. Um, so basically, this, this website goes out and actually searches the web to find something that looks like a bundle and then automatically adds it to the index. Uh, what, what's kind of neat about this, uh, and that compare, like, compares favorably to what we have with the plugin uh, uh, library for Symphony 1, is that it actually tries to apply some metrics to determine the point value for uh, the different uh, bundles. So as you can see here, it is a sort of the short version of the, the rating system. So any follower on GitHub gets you one point. Uh, if you have a readme, uh, that is at least 300 characters long. So you know, as an indicator of some level of documentation, you get five points. Uh, if you use the Travis CI continuous integration service, you also get five points. If the tests are actually passing on there, you get five more points. Um, if you provide a composer uh, file, you also get five points if you have people recommending, et cetera. So this is how the site looks like. Uh, as you can see here, you see the, the top five bundles there uh, with the point values. Uh, so first user bundle is by far the most highly rated bundle uh, with 1,241 points. And it gets, you know, um, you know, some bundles on there only have, uh, you know, one point maybe or something like that, but indicates that they don't even have a readme that is 300 characters long. But so with these point values, it already gives you sort of an indicator how well maintained that bundle is and how much you know, um, new features you can expect, how well you are, or how high the chances are that the uh, bugs will be fixed quickly, and more, most importantly also, how, um, how good the quality is of the code inside. That being said, of course, when a bundle gets created the first time, you know, it may end up having a lower score. So it, Having a score below 100 does not mean that it's necessarily a bad bundle. It just means that maybe you need to check uh, a little bit more detailed. But again, I, I just want to stress that again. Before you go and create a bundle, check if there is a bundle for it before. Uh, so as you saw, we have almost 1,200 bundles now. And I'm sure about half of them, at least, are redundant. Because we have like, I don't know, eight bundles that integrate Twitter Bootstrap. Uh, I think we have like five or six that you know do pagination and all that stuff. 
Okay, so let's start with the best practices. So these apply really when you want to share bundles. In your internal code, you can follow them. If you don't follow them, it's your issue, not the issue of others. But for when you share it, so what de defines it as a bundle is the bundle class. If you don't have a bundle class, it's not a bundle. And the naming of the bundle class should follow the best practices because it should be unique among all bundles used in the project. This is why for the my bundle, it's in the Acme vendor, and so we put it in the class because it will be used by Symfony as an identifier. Then command and controller namespaces who hold the, bar, the command line commands and the controllers. Then entities or document if you will use the ODM come here because if you could put them elsewhere, but it would be more difficult because they could not be auto detected. You would have the end user would have to map them explicitly. So let's make it easier for the end user. And then there is resources, and here the probably the most important one is not views or config, it's doc. Because if you don't have doc, people will hate you when they will try to use it. Well, it does not really matter if you put the doc in resource doc or directly in the readme, but please write doc. So then public for assets and views for templates. Maybe uh, one more thing to note is with the meta directory, um, that's meant for, for example, things like a license file. Whenever you're using somebody else's bundle, make sure you check the license to ensure that it's actually compatible with what you're doing. That being said, most bundles you can find on kmpbundles.com use the MIT license, which is also what Symphony 2 uses, which is a very permissive license. But you really make sure uh, that you also check the license before using somebody else's bundle. OK, so then to configure the bundle, so I will not detail too much there because we'll just have to talk about it, but prefix all services with the alias of the bundle, so because otherwise you will have conflict and it will replace other services. So for instance, in the Acme My Bundle, all services will start with Acme underscore my dot something, which is what the get alias method of the extension will return. And if you want to provide some configurable parameters to the user, put them through the semantic configuration. Don't let the user guess what all parameters used internally are, because if they have to replace them, it will not be validated. And if you want to change one, you will not be pro able to provide a BC layer for it. So, and you will not be able to document it easily. So please use the configuration to under all configurable things. And if you want to replace services from other bundles, the right way to do is the compiler passes, because they will ensure that even if your bundle is registered before the other one, when the compiler pass run, all services of the other bundle will be there. If you just do it in your extension class, if you want to modify your service, you will just not see it because it will never be there. And if you want to replace it fully, it will work only if the bundle comes after and you don't control the order in which the end user registers bundles. So please don't rely on the order, but use it in a clean way to replace them. So here, here the structure in the dependency JSON folder, the configuration class and the extension class, which are generated when you generate a bundle, and then the compiler passes in the sub, uh, sub namespace compiler. So here is an example. So it's mostly uh, the code which is generated for you. The only part which will not be generated is the end when you handle the configuration. So this code is about loading some services and then handling some configurations. So for instance, here, it's a simple configuration. It just registers a set of parameters which come from the, which are already validated here with the configuration class. So then for the configuration class, there was already a talk about it yesterday explaining all of this. So if you want more details, just look at the slide because they were great talk about it. So here, you can see that this was the Acme My bundle with the root node and a few children which are what you want the user to configure. 
And the rule is, if something is not there, then this thing is not an extension point for your bundle. It, they should not have to worry about all the parameters, all, because it would mean they are hacking your bundle, and then if you change something and it broke their code, if it was in this, it's your fault. If it was not in the configuration, it's their issue, because they were hacking your bundle. So if you want to make it configurable, do it cleanly. And this way, you will be able to provide a BC layer if you want to rename some keys. The, with this system, it's possible. And even better, in Symfony 2.1, there is a uh, command line command which will allow you to dump the documentation for the configuration directly. This is what is used for the official doc, for instance. So in 2.0, you don't have it yet. And then another best practice, which will be quite a requirement from 2.1, is having a composer.json file because people will hate you if they have to map the bundle explicitly, or they will send you a pull request, depending how much motivated they are. Because, and bundles should also be on packages, because if you just uh, add the file and don't register it on packages, they will also hate you, and they will probably just add themselves themselves and be the maintainer on packages, which will mean that later you will have issues when you want to fork the update or something like that. And also, one thing which is not probably known by most people, packages like the commit hook on GitHub. Currently, if you pu just push and just register it like that, packages will update the, your package one hour later, or maybe, I don't remember, at one time it was even four hours later because there were performance issues. With the hook, it will be one minute, two minutes later, just the time to be notified. So this is a simple composer JSON. So and the best practices for bundle is to require framework bundle, not the whole framework. So if you also need tweak bundle, you should put it there because this will allow the end user to choose whether they want the full framework or just getting the bundle they need. If you require symphony slash symphony, the end user does not have a choice. They have to use symphony slash symphony itself. And so they probably will have code they don't need. Uh, maybe one thing more to mention. So once you start doing like your own uh, bundles uh, that you might not want to make public, then you can set up your own packages. Um, I think, uh, what's the package called again? For is, is, is it? There uh, is Satis for small uh, package repositories, so it's just generate a static file and you can have it easily. And if you want to have thousands of bundles, then you can even use packages itself, but it's more complicated. Satis is really easy because it just generates a static file and you put it somewhere and then can use it. So it's uh, primarily done for people with private packages. Um, yeah. So really, you, you, if, even for your proprietary bundles, uh, you will have, you can set up a simple server similar to what Packages offers you to, to also manage these so you can uh, more easily uh, fetch those dependencies. OK, so the next thing uh, any good bundle should offer is tests. Um, you basically have two options of testing. Uh, you know, in general, there's unit tests and functional tests. Uh, for the most part, um, I believe that you should use unit tests mostly for libraries and functional tests for things like commands and uh, controllers. Um, so uh, you, you're free to do whatever you want. So if you want, you can also unit test your controllers. Uh, I don't think that there's a huge benefit there um, because for the most part, your controllers should be very lean and small um, and just use other services. And these other services you should unit test. But uh, I digress a little bit. so. Um, Getting back to the main topic, um, so the best practice is you created a folder called tests, and then you just put your uh, test in there. Um, here we have a little code example of a functional test. Um, and as you can see here, with a, if you're just extending the web test case class, 
um, you can very easily use the create client method to sort of create a virtual uh, or you know an in-memory browser and then actually fetch uh, URLs uh, in your application um, you know then check the status code of it check the the content that you get re returned um, this is actually a quite sophisticated solution you can you even follow redirects uh, fill out forms and things like that um, there's another bundle that uh, expands a little bit on web test case uh, which is called leave functional test case bundle uh, which adds some more features like uh, loading fixtures and things like that now there's another bundle called JMS command bundle what's nice about that bundle is that it can actually generate you a kernel that you can then use for your functional tests um, in my applications, usually what I do is if I have uh, a proprietary bundle, um, I actually test it with the kernel of the application. However, if I'm creating a bundle that I expect other people to reuse, then it makes sense to e even bundle a small kernel for the functional test so you can uh, test the, the bundle on its own. Oops, went a little bit fast here. So another thing that I mentioned when I was talking about KMP bundles is that this is Travis CI service, uh, which is basically a continuous integration server um, that is run in the cloud and that you can very easily integrate to if you're placing your bundles on GitHub. All you have to do is you have to create a .travis.yaml file and uh, enable a hook on GitHub, which is actually very easy. You can just go to the Travis CI website click login with your GitHub account, and then you get a list of all the repositories you have access to on GitHub, and you have a little flip switch there that you can set to on if you want to enable the uh, commit hook. And then you can essentially test against multiple versions of PHP, multiple different databases, multiple versions of libraries and things like that. So in this simple file, we see the first line here, language PHP means we're going to test with PHP. Then from line of three on, we're defining that we're going to test against the latest versions of PHP 5.3 and 5.4. As a matter of fact, you can even test against release candidates and things like that. The next thing, uh, line seven, we create two environments. And the interesting thing is that it's going to test those two environments against all uh, both versions. So with what we define for the PHP versions and the environment, we're actually going to run four tests, uh, test runs separately. One with PHP 5.3 and MySQL, one with PHP 5.3 and Postgres, and the same thing for PHP 5.4. And you can create new environments, for example, for testing against Symfony 2.1 and Symfony uh, 2.0 and things like that. Then furthermore, you have the option of running a before script. Uh, in this case, we're using it to you know, download Composer and then run Composer to install our dependencies. And then we also run a little uh, database setup script uh, to maybe create a database and maybe populate it uh, so that we have some data for our uh, unit tests that we're then running. As you can see here with the script line, we, you can pass in additional options for PHP unit, like generating code coverage reports. And then finally, you can add notification settings so that you automatically get notified in case of a test failure. Um, or if the tests have been failing, you also get an email once the tests are passing again. And the notification is not needed generally because if by default it will notify the guy who did the commit triggering the build. Exactly. And so when you use uh, shared bundles, you will generally want to customize it. So the first place which you will want to customize and you will probably always want to customize it are templates because shared bundles cannot have templates fitting your own design. The first way to do it is the most simple one is to put the new template in the app resources folder following the name of the bundle. So here we will want to change the login template of first user bundle. This is the most easier because you can put all bundles overriding them there. Uh, there is just one thing to remember when you add a new template there, you need to clear your cache because Twig will not know that, oh, I should use another file as source. So the first time you need to clear the cache, e even in the dev environment. And the other way to do is to create a child bundle, which will extend the, uh, the other bundle and be able to replace the template. So, and then you will put the templates in the bundle, so with the same structure than in first user bundle. So view, security, login, that HTML, that twig. But the issue here, if you use always this way, it means that you will have to create one bundle per 
parent bundle because you can only have one parent. So for templates, if you just need a template, the first way is probably easier. However, creating a child bundle is required when you want to override controllers too. So in this way, you just create a child bundle and then you put a controller in the controller folder with the same name. And then it will be called by the controller resolver when finding it. But you need to remember that all actions will use the child bundle. So if you just want to replace one action of the controller, you will still need to define the other actions of the same controller, otherwise the routing will fail. So most of the time what you want to do is extend the parent class so you will be sure to have the actions. But uh, this was an issue for some people because they forgot to extend and so other methods were not defined anymore. And I don't remember if you need to clear the cache or not after adding a new controller. I don't think so. Okay, so now if you're using a third party bundle, um, you may be evaluated based on the criteria for the best practice we mentioned before. If you want to fix the bug in one of these bundles that is uh, up on GitHub, um, there's one way to do it very easily, and that's especially useful if you're trying to just uh, fix a documentation bug. Uh, so the first thing you need is a GitHub account, and then you can just go to the GitHub repository of the given bundle, browse to the file that you want to fix, and then you just click the edit this file uh, button. You can then inline edit the file, and when you then, uh, you can also set a commit message, and then when you submit that, it actually, what it does is it's going to create a fork of that bundle in your uh, GitHub account and submit a pull request at the same time for you. So this is a very, very easy way if you just, you know, quickly want to edit something small uh, that is, you know, maybe a little bit off, like a typo in a readme or something like that. Now, if the change is a little bit more complex, what you have to do is you actually have to then fork the project, um, and then you can, uh, you know, do all your changes. Uh, and generally, I would always recommend to do any changes uh, in a branch, not in master, uh, because the problem is whenever you are going to work on any changes, it's not guaranteed that the author will accept your changes. Um, so in some situations, the author might recognize that you're fixing a valid issue, but based on their experience, they might choose to do it in a different way. And so if you work in master, your uh, fork might become incompatible and very hard to deal with. So in general, always create a branch, then you know, do your change, push it up to GitHub, and then you can use the, um, then you go on to your uh, GitHub repository, um, choose the branch from the branch list, and then click the pull request button, and then you can send a pull request to the maintainer of the bundle that you're trying to change. One of the important things to also remember here is that when you're changing code, try to follow the Symfony 2 coding conventions. Um, they're documented up on the website, um, and they follow pretty much uh, the, the most common uh, standards in the PHP community itself. Um, and it just makes uh, life for everybody a lot easier when you do that. One interesting thing that I, with Travis is that when you fork a bundle on Travis, you can also enable, uh, sorry, when you fork a bundle on GitHub, you can also enable the Travis hook for your fork. So you can actually run the test before you submit a pull request um, by using Travis. Alternatively, you should, of course, run the less tests locally before you submit a pull request um, yeah, to just ensure that you know, you're not wasting the time of the maintainer of the bundle to run the test and discover that they're failing and things like that. So now we are featuring a few bundles. So the first one, well, it was the first on KNP bundle, so it comes first here. It's first user bundle. So many people are still asking us about how does it authenticate? First user bundle does not do authentication. Authentication is done by security bundle. First user bundle is about users, so providing user man management, and it integrates well with user security bundle. It even requires it. So it offers controllers for registration, password resetting, and a few more. And it supports several backends. So it, you can persist your user in the Doctrine ORM, MongoDB ODM, KuchDB ODM, and Propel 1. We will probably soon add support for Propel 2 as soon as the bundle, the Propel bundle is updated. 
And you can also add your own storage layer if you want to persist it to a web service or the, something like that. So just implement the interface and you will have another one. And all features of the bundle will work with your new layer. But what's also important to note about this bundle, um, in case you attended um, Johannes' security talk, where he talked about the difference between authentication providers and user providers. So given maybe you want to authenticate against Facebook, you can use the FOSS Facebook bundle to do the authentication part, and then use the FOSS user bundle as a user provider to persist that data in a database so that you can also query that user then locally. Yes, yeah, so another bundle, and um, most of you probably already have it in your project because it's part of the standard edition, is the GMS Security Extra Bundle, which adds a few features on top of the security bundle and the security components. So it's pro mostly annotation-based security checks. So instead of doing, getting the security context in your controller and doing some checks and throwing the exception in the controller, you can simply add an annotation on the me method and it will check it. And it even works for ATL check. Um, the other features, which is only in the 1.1 version of the bundle, is the expression-based permissions, which are a powerful way to do checks. So for instance, checking that a user has this role or does not have another role, um, which is quite difficult to do uh, because with the security bundle alone, because you have to do several calls to check stuff. Um, the expression base allows to do it more efficiently. And it can do exp expression based check in the tweak templates, in the annotations, and so on. So, and there is uh, some documentation about it explaining how you can use it. So, here is an example. So, we just add uh, the secure annotation on the action. And so this will require to have the role admin to get there. It's basically replace all code we have commented here. So without using the bundle, you would have to write this code. And with the annotation, you can just get rid of it and be done with it. It will do the check each time. OK, we're coming to the next bundle from Johannes. Um, this is the JMS Serializer bundle. Um, there's actually a core component of Symfony 2 that's called Serializer um, that implements a very simple solution to easily uh, serialize uh, array structures and object graphs into XML, JSON, and so on, so on and so forth. The JMS Serializer bundle implements a similar uh, feature set, but just uh, a lot more sophisticated. Um, the idea here is that it uses what is called the visitor pattern. So uh, you can define visitors, and actually the bundle comes with a, a bunch of uh, core visitors that allow you, they basically traverse the object graph, and any visitor can, can specify if it actually uh, has completed manipulating that object graph into the given uh, data structure that you're trying to serialize to. What that means is that you can do very flexible serialization uh, strategies that are different for each format. So you can really provide an optimized XML structure and an optimized JSON structure from the same object graph. And it also provides features um, like versioning and group-based serialization rules. So you can annotate your objects uh, to specify, like, this should only be exposed for this version, or this serialization rule only applies to this group. And then you can, when, before you serialize, you specify which version and which groups you want to use as part of this serialization call. So um, you can use this, uh, for example, uh, as you can see here, we basically define a class. Um, and uh, we are importing uh, the annotation um, from Serializer. Um, and so for example, on line 7, we're configuring that uh, the root XML tag for serializing this object graph should be response. And on the next slide, I'll, I'll show an output example of that. Then we have a collection. Uh, and again, for XML, we're configuring that this collection should not be uh, in a list of like articles, uh, like article, articles tag, and then inside to have the article tag, but actually be inlined. Um, and again, on the next slide, we'll see an example of that. And then we also have another property called page. Um, so. Whoops, I think we've screwed up in the order there. OK. 
Ah, okay, let me, I will come to the, how that uh, response looks when uh, explaining the next bundle. But the idea really is here, um, if you want to optimally use JMS Serializer bundle, you just have to ensure that you're, you represent your data as an object graph, and then you can define all these rules uh, for serialization. And uh, I'm going to come to the next bundle, FOSS-REST bundle, which actually uses JMS Serializer bundle to make it easy to, uh, to provide uh, RESTful APIs um, that support both HTML, uh, XML, and even JSON at, with the same code. Um, there are a couple other features in the FOSS-REST bundle, for example, for also automatically generating your routes based on conventions. So it examines the name of your uh, methods in your controller and automatically generates routes for you. Um, there's a, a listener for handling accept header negotiation. So um, it can look at uh, what was requested. Um, so instead of doing like dot JSON to get the JSON response, you could uh, send an accept header with application slash JSON. Um, another feature is request body decoding. So when you're sending a, a JSON request, for example, you can actually have the content um, of that request contain JSON, and then it gets automatically decoded, and uh, it replaces what normally you would uh, get via dollar underscore post. And then finally, there is a solution to do uh, parameter uh, parsing and validation for get parameters. So let's have a quick look here. Um, so we have a, we created a REST controller here. Um, notice the name on line 17 of that um, action, get articles action. That means uh, what this action is about is just defining a get request on the articles collection. So if you uh, look up again on uh, line eight, this is actually the pattern that is generated uh, in the routing system based on uh, that action name. Um, then the other thing that we see is that on line 17, we're passing in a parameter called dollar $page. And this is, as you see up, uh, on line 8, is not a route pattern. This is actually a get parameter. And this works because on line 14, we added an annotation called query param, where we specified that name uh, page. We can specify uh, the requirements. Uh, so we're requiring that this is an integer. Um, and then finally, uh, we set a default. So if page is not passed in, it's going to default to one. Furthermore, if you pass in something else than an integer, it's also going to switch to the default of one. Now, as you can see here, we're basically we're creating, a, a, in the action itself, we're creating an array of articles, and we're passing that to <laughs> the response uh, class that we created over here, right? <coughs> and with that code, we can generate the top output there if we're, if we're outputting HTML. Um, from line 12, that's an example of the output with XML. And then from line 19, that's the um, output for JSON. Now, the interesting thing I mentioned here is that, so um, if you look at the response for XML and JSON, there's a, a big difference there. So for XML, we actually have three top-level tags for article. Whereas in uh, the JSON output, we have um, this article's uh, structure, and then underneath, we have the actual articles. And this is controlled by, if we go back here, this parameter inline equal to true. If we would set that to false, then the XML output, <laughs> output <coughs> would actually give us uh, an articles tag inside. You, you would have each of the article tags themselves. And at the same time, you can also then um, from this action here, generate HTML. And this is using the add view annotation, which is very similar to the add template annotation in the Sensio framework extra bundle, which basically, uh, based on the name of the action and the controller, infers what template what you want to use. So again, from this code, just by choosing the, the output format, you can generate any of these three output uh, variants. OK, so another one is the Stuff Doctrine extension bundle. So many people coming from Symfony 1 and Doctrine 1 were complaining about behaviors were gone in Doctrine 2. So there are the behavior extensions written by uh, Jenny Minas from KNP Labs. 
So several extensions, so timestampable, translatable, sluggable, three, and a few more. So, and the bundle, the bundle is mostly about configuring them in the Symfony project. It does not provide any logic. The first version for Symfony 2.0 was, was providing the entity to auto detect them. The new version does not even do it because it was a pain to maintain the duplicated entities. So, it's really just configuring it, the extensions. And here we have an example with the timestampable behavior. So it just adds some annotation on your entity. And this created that field will be updated on create and updated that on update automatically for you. So hooking in doctrine to do this. And it's all these uh, extensions are using the doctrine events to do the work so that you don't have to repeat it each time. And another bundle is the KNP menu bundle, which is about building the menu, because menu are quite difficult to, uh, repetitive tasks to build them efficiently. So here you build a tree of objects representing the menu. So each item in the menu will be an object in the tree. And then you can render this menu with several renderers. So a standard menu, so a list, a nested list eventually. You can have a breadcrumb renderer. So in the current release, there is no built-in breadcrumb renderer, just a method to give it, you the data, but it will be in the next release. And then you can write your own renderer. And you can also have menus provided directly from your entities. Um, for instance, the CMF uh, project wrote a, bu a bundle providing the menu directly from the, your PHP CR documents and building the menu for them so you can add your own providers for menu. So, um, yeah. Okay, the last uh, bundle we want to touch on is the Leap Imagine bundle. Uh, it provides integration with the Imagine image manipulation library. Um, so the idea of that, uh, of Imagine, is basically you can load up images, apply filters on it to generate new images. Um, so what this bundle does is it allows you to actually do this dynamically. So instead of having to generate all the different versions of the images that you need for your different websites and output formats, you can actually have that uh, generated on the fly. So basically with this bundle, you can define a set of filters uh, or filter groups and from that, it actually generates you routes to access these, um, these dynamic filters. Um, you, it's, it's quite pluggable, so you can uh, set up your custom caching uh, logic. Um, you can define your custom data loaders and things like that. Um, so here we can see how you use it in a template. So on line 7, you see how we, you can use your original source image. And then on line 12 and line 18, I'm showing how you can actually on the fly convert that JPEG image into a PNG and uh, apply a set of filter rules under, under the name my thumb. Um, and since by default it's going to cache in the file system, it only is going to generate that uh, thumbnail as a PNG on the first request and from then on it's going to be cached. Um, the difference between the first and the second example is just if you're going to generate a relative or an absolute URL and that's configured by the true parameter that you see on line 19. So this concludes our overview of bundles. Um, and now the idea is that you tell us a feature that you need on your next project, and we'll try to find a bundle for that and examine it and look at how we would evaluate that. So does anybody have a bundle that um, they want us to look for? OK. Tagging. OK, let's see. Let's see if we can find something. So the first step would be to go to KMP bundles, right? So loading, OK. So let's look for tagging. Nothing. That's sad. Just tag. OK, so we find something. So there's tag cloud. That sounds about what you want, right? Um, then there's tag bundle. Allows you to tag your entities easily. Tags. Is it fine if you go with, uh, with that bundle up there? OK, so we click on it. Oh, that's sad. 
So that might, might mean that it was in the index, but now it went away. So let's see if we can find it on GitHub. If you go there directly, Wah. that's not very responsive, GitHub. Um, let me log in here. Um, do, 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 So maybe then I get a search form somewhere. Hooray. So searching, searching, searching. Yes, it's gone. That's sad. So apparently the person thought that either he's going to make lots of money by making it uh, closed source, or they admitted that it was bad. Um, so let's have a look at this one here, tag helper. We'll convert u tag tag to diff. No, what's that? Um, bundle for adding tag relations to models. Let's just go with this one. It has a fairly high point score. Let's see what it does. So here on the KMP Bundles website, we see it has a score of 28. Uh, we see the number of contributors and followers. Uh, we see the point value, value um, how that evolved. And you even see the breakdown of how the, you know, the score it got. And you can see that uh, the list of contributors, so I've seen that name before, so that to me means that probably is something good to look into. And then it already pulls out um, uh, the, the README for you. And um, so let's just try to install it. So this year, this is still using the old approach for installing um, dependencies uh, that we are used to 2. Uh, so let's just dump it in here into the depths file. Let's uh, run the installer, Win, render, install. Uh, so it's fetching, fetching all the, I have lots of stuff in my, this, oh, I have local, oh, that's bad. So let me fix that. Hopefully it wasn't too important because now I have to do it again. Ah. OK, sorry for the lack of proper preparation here. Uh, this is because you changed it for the, for the demo slide. Ah, yes, probably. Um, running again. OK, now I think we're there. So we checked out the code. Um, actually, I forgot to do one thing. We haven't checked the license yet, so I don't know if we're you know, we are now in a licensing hotbed. Uh, unfortunately, GitHub make, makes it impossible to clearly specify that. So as we can see here, if you chose for license, I don't see anything. So that's bad. Let's see in the file itself. For them, see the license file. So let's see if they added it in the, no. So this means this file, this, this bundle actually does not have a license, so let's do that. Let's, um, let's uh, open a ticket here. Please add a license to the bundle. Thanks. Someone have a photo to add it to the ticket? <laughs> yeah, okay. So there you go. But anyway, let's, um, I mean, we, uh, we don't necessarily need a license to play around with it a little bit locally. Uh, but of course, before we ship it to a client, we should uh, know that, you know, what the license is in the end. So anyway, so this code was checked out here. Um, well, let's make some stuff a little bit bigger here. So, okay, this is a very uneventful bundle class, uh, which is, you know, what you normally would expect. Most bundle classes look like this. Um, and then we have, and that's probably what I will look at first, right, at the extension. And let's have a, actually, we can have a look at something very cool. So that's something that Stoff mentioned. We can, oh, that's, I think it's config dump dash reference. What was the name of the bundle again? That's uh, tag, okay, so FPN tag bundle. Uh, okay, I forgot something. I need to first add it to the project. Okay. So we also needed to add it to the autoloader, but also first I need to add it in here. 
So that was FPN, right? And then tag bundle. FPN tag bundle. Then we also needed to add it to the auto loader, correct? So let's copy this line here. FPN, and that's it. And now it should work, right? Let's see. No, it needs. So this is sort of a, a problem with this solution. So we enabled the bundle, but the bundle has a mandatory piece of configuration. So in order to find out the configuration, we need to add configuration. It's unfortunate. So let's go back to the readme of the bundle itself to find out how to actually do that. So apparently, we look at installation. So we, we did this step. Ah, we missed one. So there's a taggable library. We need to add that, add that, add that. And then, OK. Oh, this, is, this looks like it could be uh, become a little bit tricky to, to demo here, um, because we might have to do uh, a lot of configuration here. OK, but let's just drop that in there, and let's hope that it works. Um, sorry, I didn't copy everything. So now we have to add that to our application configuration, the config YAML file here. So let's see if it runs now. Hooray. So what you see here is the output is generated automatically out of the configuration class. So the rules we that were defined by the bundle author in the configuration class are used to, uh, to output this here. So based on this output, we can look at, OK, we see tag class and uh, tagging class are required. OK, we already noticed that. And then obviously, this service here, that's, that seems to be optional. So that we, we can quickly go in here. We can see these, these rules being uh, specified here. So we see here, is required, is required, cannot be null, cannot be null. And then here we see we have a default value, right? That's a very cool feature of 2.1. Now, I don't think we'll get it to run just you know, this quickly, but let's look at some more code in here. Um, let's look at the entity, for example. And uh, so we have an entity here um, extending a base tag class, which is part of the doctrine extension. And what I like about this here, first, is that there are no annotations here, here because I think that would be a bad move to annotate um, the class. So we can see here. Um, you know, it's, it's providing a mapping file in XML, which means that if you enable uh, the ORM, it will automatically be mapped. So to me, this looks like a pretty good bundle. Do you have anything else? Yeah. There is also one point here. We can see it provides a mapped superclass, which means the entity will be in your code, which is also why we, there is some work to be done. But it means that if you want to add new fields in the entity, you will be able to do it. This is what we do in first user bundle, for instance. If you provide the entity directly in the bundle, it will not be extendable. So in some, sometimes it's better because it just makes it easier and extending the entity is not needed. But sometimes when you want the user to extend the entity, you would have to provide the mapped superclass because otherwise you will not be able to change the entity without changing your, your code. So this seems a great idea here to make it extendable. OK. So uh, I just noticed that we're already at the end of the talk. Maybe we have one quick question. We can't demo another bundle that we check out. Um, so anybody has a, have a question to us? Uh, it's working? OK. So uh, maybe the answer is just the KNP menu bundle. Uh, then it would be really easy. So what I need to do is, uh, for an intranet application, users with different permissions need to see different menu items. Can the KNP uh, menu bundle do it, or is there a different one that can do it? Yeah, I even think we have uh, some, I don't know, maybe it's not in the doc. Maybe it's just an issue about adding it. But the, part, the place to do it would be the menu builder, so I don't, do you have it somewhere? Um, yeah, uh, to uh, go to the yeah. GitHub page. Uh, can be Muni Builder. No, not here. Just the. So here, oh, there is also one point we did not say. But when you, we, you start using a bundle, read the documentation of the bundle. It will make it easier instead of opening issues and saying I don't know how to do it. It's in the doc.
So yeah. Something went wrong. Thanks, GitHub. Uh, yeah. No, I think what? This is not why I asked ask for the doc. Okay. Yeah. There we go. So here, if you go uh, menu, building menu, where is it? Your first menu. So here, you can when you create items, the builder can be what can do the logic you want. So here you could do some security checks. To you simply need to inject the security con context in it. So it's this one is container aware. So you already can get it from the container, and you simply do some checks, and then do if this uh, user is admin, I will add the item in the menu. If it is not, I simply don't add it. Or you could add it and simply hide it. It's uh, possible too because you can add, you can have parameters and simply hide them if they don't, you don't want to display it. So the menu builder would be the place to do this. Okay, so thank you for listening and uh, have a nice conference. Thank you.